Jan is a former president of uh, Mills College. And again, history here, Jan and I go back to when she was at the University of Maryland uh, and uh, moved from there to uh, become president of Mills College. She was a uh, former vice provost at Princeton, uh, and she's uh, currently president of Patton University. So, Jan. Got to get myself organized here and don't want to be obscured by the sign. So let's see if this is working. Thank you, Rita. Thank you for taking on the role here. Thank you, for Carla, for organizing this event. I'm very glad to have this opportunity. I've been very excited to talk to all of you about some of the new areas within higher education that I have been working on in the last 18 months or so. And just to uh, demonstrate how fast things are moving uh, in the last 18 months, I went from being the CEO interim president of a little college in Oakland that I was offering some help to Patton University, which has now morphed into a family of online higher educational institutions called, uh, the corporation is called the University Now. And I am senior vice president of University Now and on the board of Patton University. So the evolution uh, happened, has happened very rapidly. Uh, you know, when I was thinking about what I wanted to address uh, today in this context of this very rapidly moving online MOOC digital universe uh, in higher education, I've thought back about kind of the 30,000 foot view of what higher education is, where it has gone, what the impact of online uh, is really turning out to be for us as a segment of the, um, of the economy, of our ways of thinking about the world, and in particular of education. And just for a point of reference, I would uh, say, Rita gave a little bit of my background, but I started uh, teaching as a young 23-year-old, newly minted, almost minted PhD, about five blocks from here in 1972 at what was then the Open University of the City of the District of Columbia Federal City College, which then became part of the University of the District of Columbia. And my interests and my concerns at that time as a young linguist and um, academic were really all about finding ways to provide access to students across the population into higher education and in particular being concerned about access for women and for um, people of color populations that had not had those opportunities before. Got an extra strong dose of that in 12 years at the University of Maryland College Park as a faculty member and as an administrator learning a lot about the whole range of uh, the public university and the possibilities of the public university as well as what we called at that time distance learning. Maryland had the largest university college, still does I think, although Wisconsin may have surpassed it, in terms of reaching populations around the world, uh, American populations largely, and those were largely military populations who were being educated distantly from the campus. I then uh, got involved at Princeton where I'd done my graduate work as the vice provost uh, again, thinking about ways in which the research university could become more accessible and having the good, pleasure, the good fortune to work with a lot of forward-thinking people, including uh, Harold Shapiro, who went from Princeton eventually to uh, work with DeVry University um, and uh, a university that had taken an online role. And then I was 20 years at Mills College where a little liberal arts college was working very hard to frame the conversation around achievements of women and um, breaking the glass ceiling and finding ways for women to excel in every possible area of uh, inquiry and leadership. So when I decided to retire from the presidency, I thought, what's the next frontier of higher education? 
um, that I don't really know very much about. And I was very much interested in the for-profit arena and in the uh, coming of age of real digital learning, not just uh, additional pieces of technology to enhance what we were already doing in the classroom, but real digital learning that was enabling students to access um, and create knowledge and uh, create forms of inquiry by using uh, technology and other forms of inquiry that technology uh, really f fosters. So that's my history, and that's how I ended up getting involved in this latest endeavor. I want to contextualize that a little bit in terms of the context, uh, in terms of higher education overall. Very interesting statistics that I heard recently. In 1966, there were 8 million students in higher educational institutions in the United States. And there were 2,400 higher educational institutions, of which 1,400 were private or not public institutions. So um, that actually, 1966, is the, my graduation year from high school. Thinking about you know the changes for women, particularly over the course of that 50-year or so um, time span, in the year 2012, there were there were 21 million students in higher education, a little less than, um, but mm, close to three times as many as in 1966. There were twice as many higher educational institutions, 4,800 higher educational institutions, and um, only about 1,400 of them were still private higher educational institutions. The greatest growth in student enrollment to 2012 was in the for-profit educational arena. So of the 21 million students who are currently enrolled in for-profit universities, seven million, that seven million of those 21 million are enrolled in for-profit universities. Not a single for-profit university existed 25 years ago. So the University of Phoenix, DeVry, Capella, the universities that you see in your in advertisements and you hear about were not in existence. Interestingly enough, in those for-profit universities, um, the average enrollment of women is somewhere between two-thirds to 75 percent. So the growth in student enrollment and the growth in enrollment in higher education has been very much driven by the for-profit sector. It has also been driven by the enrollment of women in that sector. And um, it has also, the for-profit sector has also driven up very dramatically the level of student loan debt in this country. So if you look at the last 10 years, student loan debt in this country has doubled uh, to its current status of $1 trillion, higher than all uh, credit card debt in the country at this point. And that in part has been as a result of greater availability of higher education, greater availability of student loans, but also the fact that many, many students are entering higher education, oftentimes through a for-profit, but sometimes in a public or private institution, and incurring debt at the start of the experience and not completing the experience. So along with those statistics of 21 million students being enrolled in higher education, there are currently 36 million adults in the United States who are paying off student loans who do not have degrees. 
from colleges or universities. So those, those were the beginnings of their experience and now they're not able to use that education to, um, to be able to further their economic and, um, and workplace well-being. Now, the reality is, th I don't know the percentage of that 36 million who are women, but obviously it's going to be higher as a result of the greater enrollment of women across the board in higher education, and in particular, uh, the greater enrollment in the for-profit sector. Now, what does that have to do with um, online education? What does that have to do with online education and the proliferation of, well, we talk about MOOCs, we talk about for-profit, um, these things get very much mushed together in the conversation. So I'm going to do a little bit of disaggregating and, um, and then um, I'm going to try to talk about what the possibilities are here as well as the, um, the pitfalls, which there are, of which there are many. Um, most of us who are in the academic arena, in the higher educational arena, understand that having technology in the classroom, whether we're dealing with data or instructional tools or research or um, modes of communicating with our students, is a valuable and essential part of instruction these days and research. We understand technology as a complement and as a kind of category, a box, that a box that adds to our tool, or our tool that adds to our boxes, one or the other, you, toolbox, if, if you were, uh, if you will. And we do understand that we've had these components such as Blackboard and other uh, Moodle platforms to help us to achieve some of those technological connections. What the massive open online courses offered us and began to bring about a few years ago was sort of an inversion of that concept. Uh, basically, if you think about the organization Coursera, for example, they figured out how to get 62 high profile, um, high quality universities to allow their faculties to put courses, a faculty member to put a course onto a platform which they had built. Now, these various companies like Udacity and Coursera, they're all for profit themselves. They intended to figure out how they were going to turn these massive open online courses into a profit-making venture. Um, but they were smart in signing up universities like Stanford and Princeton uh, to be their leaders and to take these courses, which had at one point been enhanced by technology, totally technologically um, on, onto a platform and spread to as many users who could click into them and get access to them. So they went all over the world. You know, you have a sociology course from Princeton or a course on um, uh, computer technology from uh, computer science from uh, Caltech going to um, 150,000, 125,000 uh, users. Whoever could sign up could sign up. Uh, if an institution had a great deal of interest in why they were doing this, they might assign TAs and to help those students. What we've discovered, of course, is that those students who sign up are predominantly already educated. They're not signing up for course credit. They're signing up to see if they can enhance their lives and their skills. And they're signing up to test themselves against uh, a high, um, high quality institution. They're, they're not going to get course credit because uh, quite famously, um, I think it was Amy Gutman, the president of Penn said, well, we'll let our course go on Coursera, but we wouldn't give a student credit for taking it. Um, that may be somewhere down the road. So this is not a university sponsored in any way phenomenon. It is essentially 
an opportunity to kind of peer under the tent and see what's going on in the university in that way. Now, um, there's value to that because we know there's a hunger for education and educational opportunity. We know that there's a hunger for advanced education in this way. And it's also the case that it is, um, for, the, the, for the person taking it, usually very difficult to finish, very difficult to use, um, except at usually uh, cocktail parties where, or around the water cooler where everyone, you know, it's become very popular to say I failed a MOOC or I dropped out of a MOOC um, because uh, that's sort of the, it's becoming a more generalized phenomenon. At the same time, um, we are seeing that the for-profit institutions, which are the, in some ways the precursors to these MOOCs, are becoming increasingly concerned and are becoming increasingly regulated because their costs have been set at a cost structure that is really more like traditional higher education, but they're offering distance learning and they're not in many ways providing their students with graduation and graduation opportunities. And many of them, in particular, uh, I'm not picking on the University of Phoenix because I think it has, it had started um, in a very positive way, but it is probably the best known. Um, for a place like the University of Phoenix, their interest is in getting you to pay up front and use student loans to pay for your education and getting your employer, in po if possible, to remit some of your tuition as a result of your being in the workforce, as many of those students are. So we come to a point where there's a lot of attention on this notion of online education. Everybody has some sense of the fact that it's out there. M many traditional higher educators, faculty members, think of it as a threat. Some think of it as a sense of possibility. Some think of it as um, uh, uh, really drawing attention away from the things that we ought to be doing. And yet, if you look around the landscape in the workforce and you look around the landscape in a number of places, you see that online higher education, or what we might call digital learning, a learning that is interactive, uses interactive tools, is constructed for the person who simply cannot be in a structured self uh, seat time kind of environment, is going to be the wave of the future for many students. And it's really critically important that academics, educators, um, people who are thinking about social change and access, as well as really smart technologists and really innovative venture capitalists and really innovative um, uh, people who are working in their corporations to do certain kinds of credentials and learning, that we think about these questions of how to create platforms and uh, contexts in which we can engage students um, and engage them in learning that will lead them to course credit, to degrees, and eventually to opportunities to use their education either for advanced education, more education, or for, um, or for opportunities in work and in their work lives. And <coughs> one of the things my organization is doing the university now within the context of patent. I'm just going to grab my water here. Is to move away from two things. We're moving away from the seat time model that works even in the MOOC universe and in the the, uh, the traditional distance learning universe. So the seat time model says whether you are sitting in your kitchen or whether you are sitting in your classroom, you enroll for 16 weeks, you um, do the work, you have the interaction, 
you take the exam and then you or, or you do the project and then you move on to your next semester of work. Our model and the model and a number of models that are coming along is self-paced. So you enroll at the time that seems most appropriate for you. We have, we actually have uh, with uh, University Now Patent enrollment every Monday, 50 weeks a year. You um, get assessed, you assess yourself, you are assessed, you look at what the materials are that you need to work on, you consult with your faculty member, you consult with your advisor, you have a cohort of students online, and you work with those students who are at different phases in this course. And in our case, you don't, um, you don't take the final exam until, or do the final project until you're demonstrating that you are ready to do so digitally and online. It's, very, it's much more complicated than that, but it's kind of the, the, the bigger picture of how self-paced works. So that's one way in which we're deviating. The second way that we're deviating is we have cut the price completely to match the student's ability to pay. So we are, not vo we are voluntarily, although we're regionally accredited and qualified, we have voluntarily withdrawn from Title IV programs. We do not have our students accept student loans. We charge our students by the month and then by the semester. So a student pays, this goes back to my days at Federal City College, it's almost exactly the same um, uh, uh, form of um, a payment plan. It's about $329 a month or $1,300 a semester. And uh, it's intended to be a mechanism whereby if you are an employed adult, your tuition remission will cover the cost of your accredited courses as long as you are making adequate progress in those courses. It's a new, innovative, disruptive idea, um, but I think other colleges and universities are going to follow uh, suit in this regard, trying to find ways not to tie the student up without guaranteeing the student a level of success, and also helping the student to understand that you have, some, you have responsibility for how you progress, you also have responsibility for paying for your education. So let me, let me go back to the questions that prompted me in particular to want to bring a few of these ideas to this group. Number one, uh, none of the digital learning online uh, opportunities has been particularly successful in delivering STEM fields. Even in computer science, this is, this is still a very um, business-based, uh, social science-based, humanities-based endeavor for most of the majors. And that in part is because there simply haven't been that many opportunities for faculty and others in science-based fields to get involved in massive educational outreach. Um, so that is concerning to me, and I think you know there's some um, groups. I know a, a colleague of mine is uh, trying to think about starting an online engineering program. There are a number of places where this is being um, uh, played with, thought about. It's possible to create laboratories, I know, um, that could be uh, functioning in various uh, venues. But I think that is a critical question for us. But I want to match that up with the critical question around women and the impact of these new forms of learning and access to these new forms of learning for women, both locally and globally. because. The opportunity to study in an environment that is essentially private but public in an online sense, uh, connecting you to a larger world, and to get credit for it that will enable you to move across boundaries of class and region and space are 
huge, uh, just to build on Shireen's point uh, earlier on. So, and obviously, uh, not obviously, but I will say, to my, it's obvious to me that no one is thinking about this population in building these um, online opportunities. Women, as we have been in higher education generally, we are an afterthought. The idea that women are, are the big consumers now of most of technological products, or make decisions, buy them, use them, uh, that's all out there. But the idea that women would be an audience that would have a special focus in online education simply has not occurred uh, it to, to anyone and is not a high priority. So even though it was known that this would be a big audience, it was not a high priority because women always do what seems to be best um, to get themselves into a better position, and so they've taken this on. So that's one. those are two concerns I have. The third concern I have is that almost all of the work I see going on in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, in New York, in some of these other contexts where we're building <coughs> these opportunities for online education and online educational programs for corporations and online education for K-12 education. Uh, the investments are from venture capital and the stars in these arenas are um, the young men, almost all young white men who are technologically whizzes, you know, the wannabe Steve Jobs, the, the people who have this incredible uh, genius um, uh, sense of themselves. And um, you know, I'm worried that we're going from an old boys network to a young boys network, and that the power and the money and the opportunity to do the most important work is going to be still um, blocked from the perspective of women, in part because of a point that Alice made earlier on. It takes daring and courage to look around the corner and say, yeah, I'm a faculty member in a place and what I want to do is protect my institution. I don't necessarily want to have the, this competition from the outside, but I certainly don't want to become the competition. And I certainly don't see myself as being one of these people who's going to stay building this, this great Apple phone um, at the expense of anything else that might be going on um, in my life and in my universe. And I'm not going to go ask people to back me and provide me with money, especially if my point is to really create educational models that will educate women. I mean, women can get educated the way everybody else can. So why, why would I do this with this particular focus? So my concern is sort of tying this back to um, the whole notion of where are the intersections? Where are we looking for ways to change society using education, using education that focuses on the potential for research and for um, research in the sciences, and then where are we putting the emphasis on women, and women both as the leaders and those who are organizing and driving the work, and as on the learners and the future leaders and drivers of the work. So uh, Carla has said I have five minutes. Do I have a few minutes for questions as well? I want to thank you all for hearing me out, and I want to listen to everyone over the course of the next 24 hours for ideas, possibilities, um, and, um, and the ways we might shape this. Do I have room for a few questions? Hi. OK. One uh, back. Yeah. Hi, thanks. That was uh, the best discussion of online learning I've heard. This. I've heard many that made me crazy. Um, so <laughs> thank you. You mentioned briefly K through 12 uses of this. I'm really interested in um, the potential for online learning for high schools uh, that don't have the resources or think they don't have the student population for, say, AP courses, um, not just in STEM fields, but um, as someone who found herself at a high school that didn't offer any 
advanced courses and had to try to yeah. teach herself this stuff from books. Um, how do you see the potential for this uh, kind of learning to help, you know, whether minority students or, or women or whoever is at a, a school that doesn't offer actual, say, calculus courses or advanced physics? Or yeah. I, I see, well, I think this is a big discussion, but, but a number of us see that there's the crisis in K-12 education and the lack, particularly, of adequate preparation for entering into math and entering into um, uh, other areas of the STEM fields in college. It's also the case that m I would say approximately, this is nationally, 40% of the students who enter four-year colleges are not prepared to do the work, which is where the dropout comes, whether it's online or in college. So one of the areas that is rapidly developing, and it's something I'm concerned about in our, in our little group, is our bridge courses, courses we're working with independent colleges in California to create bridge courses for the student. The basic courses that they can work on online have instruction, but also have a chance to progress and dig more deeply. Those could also be a model, potentially, for AP classes and for platforms that could work in high schools as well. And what we find is kids are very technologically able, uh, but their teachers often aren't. And, the, and the, there's also a real resistance, you know, there's all the money and power behind textbooks and, and um, how you manage your facilities, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea that you could have both kinds of courses going on for students and that high school students could be taking online courses while they're in school and or completing their um, courses that could take them through the community college level, the potential is enormous. <clears throat> One last question. Florence Hazeltine. Um, I guess what I am now is an IT consultant for advocacy groups. Um, one, I was recently at a meeting uh, of mobile health technologies, which is what I develop for. I'm a developer. And um, I'm wearing a Google Glass, which is, you know, you have to be invited if you're a developer, et cetera. And what was interesting to me is a lot of people asked me questions, but they were almost all men. Now, this meeting had a lot of women. And the only person who picked me up was a 23-year-old man. And I have to say that hasn't happened in 50 years. <laughs> so uh, those Google glasses are hot. I'll That's you. it. You know. <laughs> but he is—he's doing all the things I think need to be done. Uh, he I, and I was able to introduce him to a lot of people. And I told him as I, I was not his angel investor; I was his angel connector. Uh -huh. But one of the things that is obvious to me is I know a lot of women who are interested, but um, they're not. I don't know whether they don't view themselves as capable of doing it or whether or not they're, they're not being approached, they're not approaching, it's a, it's a tough situation because I can tell you in the mobile health technology, half the people at this meeting were women. And they wouldn't, and again, it's what we all know, they, when people ask for questions, they wouldn't answer questions. So one of the things I'd like to see, because they are technologically competent, um, is to see whether or not some of these uh, online learning can, aid in that and yep. that's a project I'd be really interested in getting involved in because you know I was I was pretty happy I was picked up and I was pretty disgusted at who picked me up right yeah absolutely I, I totally agree I mean that's one of my concerns is that we figure out how to get women engaged uh, and engaged in the ownership not just the consuming of of the products yeah thank you thank you Jan thank you, thank you very much that was very interesting and we'll